Um, Dr. Rocher obtained his PhD in engineering physics at the Technical University of Vienna in Austria, working on susceptibility weighted imaging. He's the Canada Research Chair in Quantitative MRI and Associate Professor at UBC's Department of Pediatrics. He will be following up on the excellent talks this morning and talking more about myelin mapping with MRI. All right, thank you for the introduction and thanks everyone uh, to the organizers for putting this conference together. Uh, I'll share my screen. Let's start here, I hope this works. And, then, um, and I assume I have to switch my slides, is that correct? Yes. This is what you want to see, right? Yeah, okay. Perfect. Um, which means I'm not looking at the camera right now, but oh, I see it on the other side as well. It should be, that should work. Okay, yeah, so thanks so much for the introduction. I'll jump right in it so we don't lose any uh, more time. So I'm going to talk about um, myelin mapping and in particular myelin water imaging, but with a bit of a focus on the broader concept of uh, myelination, uh, not myelination, validation. Then I will try to explain like what, what is involved in validation at the example of myelin water imaging. So briefly, I will talk about what myelin is, uh, the categories of myelin mapping with MRI, uh, and then go into validation at the example of uh, myelin water imaging, and, uh, and then use the role of iron as uh, one of the confounders uh, in, in almost all quantitative MRI, I believe, and then conclude with uh, one quick slide. So myelin is the, as you probably already heard this morning, uh, the lipid bilayer or phospholipid bilayer that is wrapped around the axons. Uh, during this wrapping process, uh, the water that is within the oligodendrocyte that makes the myelin uh, is trapped. That's intracellular water. And then there's also the water between the cells trapped uh, uh, in this wrapping process is extracellular water. So the biologists uh, distinguish between those two. The MRI community just talks about this as the myelin water and the all other water is referred to as, as the inter and extracellular water. Uh, these water pools have characteristic or proton pools of characteristic MRI properties. The myelin water's relaxation time is in the range of 10 milliseconds to 20 uh, T2 relaxation time, whereas the interexocellular water lives longer, uh, 65 to 100 milliseconds. The macromolecular bound or associated protons have very short relaxation times. These can be addressed with ultra short uh, echo time imaging methods. They can also be uh, accessed with, uh, as you have already heard uh, in Carl Michael's talk, with magnetization transfer methods. Uh, another important property of the myelin sheath is that it is diamagnetic, uh, and therefore it has a, is a good modifier of the resonance frequency of the signal, which then can be translated into uh, magnetic susceptibility maps. Uh, the nice thing about that technique is that it always uses all protons in the area to probe the resonance frequency, so it does not lose signal to noise ratio as you lose myelin. So it's actually very sensitive to small changes in myelin, for example, in, in, in S lesions that are almost uh, completely demyelinated. And it also has very high spatial resolution and, and, and very high sensitivity. So that's a, a attractive method. Uh, and of course, there's also ways of mapping the uh, effects of the myelin sheath has on the diffusion properties of the water. There's a vast literature on that. Uh, so I will only talk about uh, myelin water imaging because I'm somewhat familiar with it. Uh, and that's the technique that uses the uh, T2 relaxation times to distinguish between the different water pools. Um, and um, address uh, basically the broader concept of validation uh, in this context. So what is validation? Um, Oh, yeah, I should also mention in this paper, this addresses also PET, but I would argue that the radiation that uh, is used for PET should be left used for things that are not accessible with, with, with MRI. So it's probably better to, um, yeah, do maybe microglia activation such things with PET and do the myelin stuff uh, with MRI. So validation roughly is um, a comparison of our MRI methods with something else. Uh, this could be phantoms, um, animal models, uh, human tissue ex vivo, but then also healthy humans and, and patients and brain development studies. Um, so a validation would be uh, a, if a consistent picture 
emerges from all these studies, right? And that can include applications to clinical uh, cases and so on. And it should also involve maybe different field strengths, uh, different uh, tissue types, as we already mentioned, and also look at different histology methods because they're all, you know, the, 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 the results of all these methods and all these model systems and tissue types vary slightly. So in order to get a good idea of what is actually going on in these measurements, um, it takes yeah, years of research and, and many uh, different publications across different labs until we have a, a good understanding of such a method and a good validation. Another thing I would like to address here is that uh, typically uh, an early validation study would often look into like histology versus MRI uh, and basically plot the two measures against each other. Uh, and it's uh, totally okay to include in a white matter imaging technique also gray matter and demyelinated lesions. But uh, for example, but it's important to understand that uh, the regressions that we get uh, of course differ so if someone takes this as the basis for example for a study that looks at uh, degrees of myelination as a function of years of education or some motor learning or some training or something like that where we're essentially looking at healthy white matter uh, then um, the maybe the power calculations for your study should be more based on something like this right uh, so good studies good validation studies um, do definitely uh, report, uh, you know, these R squares and also, of course, uh, uh, the R squares where non-white matter tissue is included. Uh, one example from myelin water imaging, but before we do this, we should probably go into what myelin water imaging actually is. It's been mentioned already earlier today, I believe. So it's based on the relaxation time properties of the myelin pool. So we have the um, I guess I'll give the mouse here now. Uh, we have a quickly relaxing pool, that's the myelin water, which is about 10% of the signal um, or 10% of the voxel. Uh, relaxation times are short, and then there's the longer relaxation time of the intraexocellular water, which is in the range of, uh, say, 60 to 100 milliseconds and usually comprises around 90% of the uh, voxel. Uh, the problem is uh, becomes immediately apparent. So here I'm assuming only two. Uh, relaxation times in reality it's a spectrum of t2 relaxation times of course but just for the sake of explanation i'm using two and what you see is that the the overall relaxation is very close to the long uh, living uh, water pool right so it's, it's very hard to tease out the, um, the myelin water pool but it can be done and it's basically uh, done by integrating over this relaxation property you integrate over the, the myelin peak and then divide the area uh, divided by the area over the entire spectrum. This was pioneered by Alex McKay and, and group. And if someone wants to do myelin mapping, I recommend the decays tool by John Doucette, which does this for the whole brain in about 30 seconds, which is about 100 times faster than, than earlier MATLAB implementations. So that's a, a, a nice uh, a tool to have, I think. So let's yeah go into the validation of this. So um, no, let's go into imaging. I got the order wrong here. So this needs to be imaged as well, and that's a bit challenging because we need a spin echo, a spin echo scan, uh, and this needs to be a three D scan because if we do two D, then we get magnetization transfer effects between the different slices due to the excitation of the slices. Uh, so it should be a three D spin echo scan that should ideally cover the whole um, brain. And that uh, wasn't possible until about 10 years ago where we developed a, a grace-based method. So there's some, some, some uh, EPI factor of three involved to accelerate the scan. There's also parallel imaging involved. Uh, but by doing so, one can bring the relaxation time to well below 15 minutes, uh, the, the scan time between below, vital, below 15 minutes. Uh, newer methods using compressed sensing and more advanced sampling methods um, are now well be below 10 minutes in the range of five to seven minutes even. So it can be done now, a uh, whole brain, of course, always with some compromises in terms of undersampling, uh, which is not always ideal, but at least it becomes feasible in, um, in patient populations or in humans in vivo. Uh, let's finally jump into the validation of this technique. This was also done by Alex McKay's group. Um, in, typically it's done in MS tissue, uh, like that was the early work. Uh, by Cornelia Lawley, so they uh, did this at 70, but also at, at 1.5 Tesla, still using like a single slice uh, CPMG scan and find um, R squares ranging from 0.56 to 0.95 at seven Tesla 
if all tissues included and they're also doing the right thing, they're reporting uh, what you find in uh, white matter only in, in both studies. Um, this picture is then also consistent with what we, uh, Piotr Koslowski's uh, group found, Henry Chen, they also at UBC, but that did this in rat spinal cord uh, injury at three weeks and eight weeks post injury relative to normal. So you get progressive degradation of, of axons and myelin and uh, a range of myelinations. And uh, they found an, an R square of 0.67. Um, people didn't stop there. So then there's a Cooperson mouse model. So if you feed Cooperson to uh, the animal, they, they lose myelin. Um, and um, measurements in the corpus callosum in, in, in this mouse model, also at seven Tesla, uh, gives a similar image, a picture of an R square of 0.46. Um, an interesting paper uh, is one that uh, was done at 15.2 uh, Tesla. It's a, an exciting study because it really zooms in on the, on the biophysics of, of the signal generation Right, by using very high field strength um, mouse uh, animal models that cover myelin loss, hypermyelination, and even hypermyelination and, and control mice. So they have a very nice uh, range of myelination and they, they scanned for a long time. So they have really the ideal scenario that looks at the um, biophysics of the signal generation. Right? That's a very important work to do. It's very far away from what we normally would acquire in humans, but it's, it's, it's part of the validation. And they find for myelin water um, good correlations and also an intercept that is very close to zero. It's slightly negative. They ascribe that to the possibility that there's probably exchange. So basically using myelin water signal um, to, to exchange because the axons are thin, the myelin sheath is thin. Uh, they also used the ideal scenario, I would think, uh, for myelin quantification, for non MRI myelin, myelin quantification, which is electron microscopy and they did a segmentation of the myelin sheath. So that's probably the, uh, the gold standard uh, for, for histology. They also did uh, MT. This is the bound pool fraction that is derived from uh, quantitative MT. And here you see that this intercept, of course, is not zero because uh, as you have heard already, protons can be bound to all kinds of things. It's not exclusive uh, to myelin, of course. Um, as I already said, this is like an ideal scenario. So I would argue that validation should also include uh, the, um, the scanning technique that is done in humans. Um, and that brings us to a paper by Vanessa Wigerman, where uh, brain slices were scanned at three Tesla with imaging parameters that are, are much closer to what one would run in a, in a patient. And also the field strength is closer to that. And it's also human brain again. Uh, so that gives um, a probably a bit more realistic picture of what can be um, uh, obtained with these scans, right? So it's, I see it a bit as a, not in the mathematical sense, but there's a bit of as a convolution of the biophysical principle then, and our scanning method uh, and with all its undersamplings and potential shortcomings due to acceleration and patient movement and so on. Um, so in this paper, uh, in collaboration with Simon Hametner in Vienna, uh, who does very nice histology, they were staining for iron and for myelin and also for remyelinating oligodendrocytes to get a good idea what's going on in various lesions and in normal appearing white matter and, and, normal, and uh, diffuse lip normal white matter and so on. And, um, and a comparison with a myelin water imaging scan, of course. And what uh, Vanessa found was, this is the Luxor fast blue uh, staining uh, for the, across the different lesions, active, inactive lesions, inactive lesions, and, and then progressively increasing shadow plaques, diffuse of normal white matter, normal appearing white matter. So that's kind of what you would expect. Uh, and the nice thing is that the myelin scan, myelin water scan reflects this uh, very well. Uh, the magnetization transfer, so this is qualitative MTR, not quantitative MT, uh, reflects this also somewhat, but it's not very good at distinguishing between normal appearing white matter and diffuse of normal white matter, for example. Um, which is, I think is an interesting you know, thing to look at because there is a lot of these two tissue types, right? Lesions only occupy a very small volume relative to the rest of the white matter, even in MS. Um, so there are some kind of imaging targets, right? Uh, that are beyond the actual focal demyelinated lesions. Interestingly, um, the, the, what's reflected in the Luxal fast blue is also seen attenuated in an attenuated version in the iron staining. 
uh, which is not surprising because iron and, and myelin kind of go hand in hand. Uh, it's the oligodendrocytes that contain most of the iron in MS. Um, so if there's a demyelination happening and the oligodendrocytes die, eventually also the iron disappears. Um, so this, um, not surprisingly, kind of is reflected between those two stains. And I do think that for histology studies in general, since iron has an influence, which we will see in the next slices, slides, slides um, it should be, uh, iron staining should be always part in every myelination uh, or myelin imaging uh, validation study. Um, yeah, with that, we, we move on to iron actually. Uh, so as I said, iron is uh, an important like, substance for the uh, myelin generation. Um, as you can see in this uh, study uh, in, in animals where they had iron deficient and iron deficient animal model and then this animal model fails to myelinate in a normal way. So the control of the wild type has a nice myelination as you see in these dark areas, corpus callosum for example, whereas the, the iron deficient mouse does not myelinate uh, that well. Um, and when you look at these stains, as you know, the, the gray matter is rich in iron, the, mild, the white matter has less iron, but there is iron present in the white matter. Um, and the, the myelin stain uh, below is, is reflecting myelin, of course. And the question, of course, arises, uh, myelin, uh, iron is a strong like paramagnetic, it's a paramagnetic substance, so it is a strong modifier of the MRI signal. It has the ability to shorten the T2 relaxation times. And since we are using T2 relaxation times in myelin imaging or myelin water imaging, um, it may have an influence, right? And so Christoph Birkel uh, looked into this uh, and asked the question, what does iron do to the myelin water signal? And uh, to look into that, he extracted iron chemically with an iron chelator in, in ex vivo brain tissue samples. Um, there was uh, histology for iron, uh, depending what monitor you have, you may see some faint iron here and a bit more here. Uh, and you see the myelin stain does not change between uh, the iron extraction and the non-iron extraction. And then what happens is that in both the CPMG, which is like the non-accelerated uh, myelin scan and the faster grace scan, in both cases, uh, the myelin or the apparent myelin water fraction, I should say now, uh, is reduced by about 25 to 28% due to the iron extraction. So that's described in this 2019 paper. There's another paper that also looks at the uh, iron oxidation state, uh, which also has an influence on, on MRI measures. And the iron extraction, which also is covered in this paper, is also uh, has an influence on R1, R2 star, and MTR, of course, uh, which is not, uh, not too surprising. Um, so yes, iron does have an influence on uh, the myelin water signal. And that brings us back to the image I've shown before. So some of you may have already noticed uh, that the deep gray matter is very bright on these myelin maps, and that is uh, very likely uh, due to iron, and almost certainly due to iron. Right? This is the T2 shortening properties of the iron in the deep gray matter that creates these, because deep gray matter or gray matter in general has very low myelin content, so this is uh, artifactual. Um, a paper just came out this week or the last where they did gradient echo M uh, myelin water imaging uh, at 3 Tesla. Well, first, you see all these typical artifacts that you would get uh, in areas of field inhomogeneity. So the acceleration is so fast that in the area near the nasal sinus and, and auditory canals, um, it's all a mess, right? This is not myelin, this is an artifact. Things get better when you go away from these areas. So in the higher brain regions, these myelin maps look quite reasonable. But the cool thing that they did is that they then also scanned uh, with gradient echo uh, at uh, 0.55 Tesla. And there the susceptibility effects, of course, are much weaker and almost absent. And the whole signal is governed by the intrinsic T2 um, that the myelin water has versus the intra-exocellular water. So we're not looking or we're not seeing really any or hardly any susceptibility effects in this case, uh, because they play no role at 0.55 Tesla. And it's the intrinsic water T2 uh, relaxation time that really pops out even in a, in a, in a what would be a T2 star weighted uh, scan. And you also see that the, the complete absence of any artifactual iron um, signal in the deep gray matter uh, which again is in line with the, the fact that uh, there shouldn't be much of a susceptibility effect in these data. 
Uh, and from what I can tell, this is some of the best Mylan maps I've ever seen, even though the field strength is very low. And it's actually because the field strength is very low. And also because it's a gradient echo scan, so they were able to have an echo spacing of three milliseconds, uh, which is very hard to do in a human brain. Um, a typical echo spacing is more like maybe six milliseconds, depending on spatial resolution and so on. So this rapid echo spacing in the early echoes allows them to have a very good sampling of the of the myelin peak or the myelin relaxation time, and that more than compensates, it seems, uh, for the uh, lower magnetization that they have at only 0.55 Tesla. So that's a very cool paper, and it shows actually then also kind of confirms and validates the underlying idea uh, that myelin water imaging is works because of the intrinsic T2 uh, that is not affected by uh, susceptibility effects that you have because myelin water sits in this confined space. So that does actually pop out because otherwise one could maybe argue maybe it's the shortening of the myelin water signal due to the uh, susceptibility of the myelin sheath itself, right? Which does have an influence, especially at 3 Tesla. Um, it leads to orientation effects that I can't address here. It uh, would take too long. Um, yeah, so that's a, a quite a cool paper, I must say. And I think with this, we're already at the uh, conclusion slide. So one thing I would like to emphasize is that a good correlation between MRI and histology is a necessary but not a sufficient evidence for specificity, right? That's basically um, saying that um, correlation doesn't mean causation. That's uh, demonstrated by myelin waters uh, imaging sensitivity to iron, for example, right? So normally, since they go kind of hand in hand, iron and myelin, uh, it's not too apparent, but it's possible that the, the link between myelin and iron, the biological link kind of breaks due to some diseases and so on. And then you would have myelin and the iron changing independently. And that kind of has an influence on the myelin water signal, of course. Um, another thing that I find important is that the, the, you know, the best scan at ultra high field and very well controlled animals with electron microscopy as histology or so, this may give fantastic results and a very good um, you know, demonstration of the, the, the underlying biophysics of a scan, but it may not be the best scan then in an in vivo setting because it takes too long, right? Um, yeah, different considerations apply to imaging or like across entire clinical trials. For example, MS lesions, some MS lesions have an increase in iron as Simon Hametner has shown. Uh, if you want to look for these um, references, they are found in some of these uh, review articles that are listed below. Um, so in an individual patient, that's a problem, right? If you want to know exactly what's going on in a particular lesion or in a particular patient, that's a problem. But across a clinical trial, this becomes noise. So in a clinical trial, you could argue maybe uh, we should run uh, QSM, even though it has a higher sensitivity to iron than myelin water imaging or other techniques. Um, I say, yeah, I think correlation studies should always control for iron. Um, however, uh, one should be aware that rodents, for example, have less iron in the brain than humans. Uh, fixation also leads to a removal of iron, so that's also something that is is uh, important to know. And I would say there's no uh, MRI technique that is well perfectly specific or highly specific for myelin, but there's a lot of techniques that that uh, are useful. And another thing that's um, apparent from the literature, but I think this may have changed. I'm not fully up to date. Um, that uh, some um, studies are still requiring um, correlation studies uh, in, in, in post-mortem tissue or in animal tissue. Um, most prominently McDespot, which is used a lot as a myelin marker, uh, but also T1 over T2 fingerprinting and Vista and uh, MR elastography even is sensitive to myelin. Um, yeah, with this, I'm at the end of my talk and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Oh yeah, and here's a slide if you can want to have a quick screenshot. Uh, that's a lot of literature on various topics. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much for your talk. Do we have any questions yet, or Lee or Olivier? Yes, so I have a couple. Uh, so first from Dorian Christina uh, is asking if iron also affects and confound more traditional different measures uh, like fixed based or DTI measures, particularly in subcortical nuclei like the putamen or, or pallidum. Oh, whether it affects DTI? Did I hear this right? Yes. Uh, I, in, a, in, the, in the most trivial way, it would affect DTI because it 
definitely shortens to T2, and then it reduces your SNR, so I can say that for sure. Um, the iron will also create local field gradients that may overlap, uh, that, that might interact with the diffusion gradient, so that could also lead to some changes in the DTI measures, that wouldn't surprise me either. Um, so my, I'm not, and I'm a non-expert for DTI, so intuitively I would say yes, but I'm aware this, that this is, could be not quite right, actually. But one would think so, yeah. Um, we also have a question from Jin Chen. Uh, she's asking, so she said, uh, you talked about some benefits of lower field strength, but are there any possible benefits of myelin imaging in high field strength, especially in MS patients, given high sensitivity of the signal? Um, yes, but there are challenges. So we, we, we tried that and with moderate success. It's published a paper by Vanessa Wigeman in NMR Biomed 2020, I believe. So we tried the gray sequence at, at uh, 7 Tesla. And um, it kind of works. I would now say that the uh, compressed sensing approaches are, are better because it doesn't require any EPI uh, readout. Uh, but we haven't tried that yet. So yes, I think it would work. The T2 does not get shortened as much as T2 star when you increase the field strength. So that is definitely helpful. Uh, so, uh, but then the other considerations that play a role if you have uh, multiple spin echoes, 32, 48, or even more at uh, seven Tesla that will cause uh, specific absorption rate problems. So it will force you to increase the TR. So we, we observed that, of course, as well in our, uh, this one seven Tesla study that we did. So when you can run TR of a thousand milliseconds at three Tesla, you have to kind of double it or at least to 1500 milliseconds. And that's mainly because of, of SAR considerations. Um, but I must say our seven Tesla mile in water maps did uh, by far not look as good as the 0.55 gradient echo mile in water maps that we just saw in this uh, one of the last slides. Amazing. So we have a couple more questions. I'm just going to ask you one. We can keep zero there for the uh, discussion at the end if we have time. So a question from Olivier Baron is asking, are myelin and iron always, almost always correlated in pathology? Or are there scenarios in certain diseases where there could be a decrease in myelin sheath density, but not loss of iron or oligodendrocytes? Um, well, we, we found one, um, which is not a loss of myelin sheath, but we did, we did a study in concussion and we saw a change in the myelin water fraction, but that is uh, very likely due to a, a decompaction of the myelin sheath, um, which was, was also seen in, in animal studies. Uh, so we, there's no loss of myelin and very likely no loss of oligodendrocytes, but the myelin water signal, not the actual myelin content, but the myelin water signal uh, did change in that case. Um, let me think there may be, um, it could be, I, I, yeah, that's something really for MS um, experts. It could be that when, when there's demyelination to even to a degree of oligodendrocyte loss that in the case of remyelination, that some nearby uh, still alive oligodendrocytes maybe take on some of the myelination task. So the number of oligodendrocytes may not go up, but the myelin may increase. I can see that happening. If that, I'm sure there's some MS expert on this. Uh, on this. I, think, I think that's a good point. Uh, if I can interrupt, uh, I have a slide on that that kind of shows that. Brilliant, yeah, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Uh, so maybe it's a good time to move on. There is additional mm -hmm. questions, but again, uh, just for the question of timing, we're going to uh, continue with the program. Thank you so much. It was a great uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Bye.